I said, most of those Austrians would have been uh, Slovenians, Croatians. Uh, you can also see a sizable uh, population of African Americans, most of them uh, in the in Cokedon in particular, but it's spread throughout the region uh, as well. And there were many immigrants who lived in some of these outlying camps that I showed on that one slide, places like Ben Bush, Pierce, uh, Douglas, Cokedon. This is a, an image of Pierce, which uh, Tom and I were talking about before we joined. He was trying to have a visualization of what this would have looked like. This is what the, uh, the town would have looked like. You can kind of see the railroad here. You can see the sort of lines of company owned houses. Um, I haven't been through that area in a while, but I, I don't, I, I think I just went past it without even knowing uh, that's where Pierce used to be. There are lots of places like this throughout, uh, throughout West Virginia where this sort of boom and bust, uh, this rapid change that happened uh, sort of see it in many places. And there are a number of families, uh, as I said, who come to Tucker County during this time period, M many of them from Eastern Europe, uh, from Southern Europe as well. Uh, <clears throat> Salvatore and Vanzinio de Baca arrived in the late 1890s, uh, and they eventually entered sort of the small business class Salvatore. I uh, was born in Italy in January of 1882 and arrived with his brother uh, in 1899. And they found a job initially in the Coke ovens uh, in Cokedon, uh, one of those small uh, towns near Thomas. As was often common for most of these immigrants who lived in Tucker County, uh, they would often go back on a regular basis. So Salvatore actually returned to Italy fairly quickly three years later in 1902, uh, where he uh, married his wife. Uh, he and his wife and his brother came back, and as time went on, they had accumulated enough money from working in the Coke ovens uh, for a number of years that they opened a general merchandise store in Thomas in 1903, uh, continuing a sort of brother-brother uh, brother partnership until 1918 when Salvatore formed a grocery store and his brother Vincent a hardware store. Uh, Mary DeBaca, as you can see here in this pic picture from that uh, company publication, uh, was also one of the first Italian immigrants to uh, come to and work for the uh, Davis Coal and Coke Company mines in Pierce. Uh, in Pierce, the company had three separate mines operating, and as he as was noted in a sort of description of his life, uh, he he came and laid initially railroad track uh, into Pierce, helped erect some of the early buildings, and then stayed on uh, as a miner afterwards. Later, bringing his family. Uh, the company promoted him in their publication, always noting that he was a loyal employee who has, quote, helped to make Pierce. He has seen Pierce grow from a barren mountaintop to a thriving mining town and, it, and proud of it. There are many different examples like this, particularly from the Italian community, uh, many, many individuals who later opened small businesses. But as we'll talk about, uh, hopefully in the Q&A, uh, you know, there's a large sizable number of Italian immigrants in particular who actually will go back home and never permanently stay uh, in the region. Um, uh, so just some other images of other uh, prominent uh, uh, Italian immigrant owned businesses, Joe's, Joe DiPaolo's store here. Artie. Benedetto, who uh, had a number of business enterprises, most notably uh, running an Italian-American newspaper, of which we have some uh, issues of it preserved here at the library here at WVU. And in all of these small communities throughout the region, uh, they, they have their own uh, sort of ethnic associations, Sons of Italy chapters, among, uh, among many other types of organizations, uh, you know, uh, Sons of uh, Lithuania, National Croatian Society, the St. Stephen Society for Southeastern European immigrants. Um, and many of them had you know, cultural musical groups. Uh, one of the most visual elements of this sort of local immigrant culture in the region were musical bands and singing groups. 
Um, one of the most prominent, which you can see here, is the Italian band out of the small mining town of Pierce. Uh, it was one of the most widely known throughout the region. It's led by an Italian immigrant named Patsy Santangelo. Uh, and all the men in the band, as you can see here in this photograph, also worked in the mines for Davis, Coal and Coke. Uh, they conduct, uh, had regular meetings, practiced hard even that while they were working. Uh, they were often asked to play for mining institute meetings uh, and traveled to Thomas, to Elkins, and even other places across the state. Uh, when many of the men, uh, you know, obviously served in World War I, and they uh, led a large massive parade that took place in June 1919 when local individuals returned from serving in uh, World War I and would often play regular 4th of July celebrations at, at, at Elkins. Another example of this uh, is the Mountain Echo Singing Club as it was uh, sort of known in its Anglo form. Uh, this was, uh, uh, again, one of those things coming out of that large Austrian immigrant group. Uh, this was largely formed by uh, those Slovenian immigrants who had arrived uh, during this time, and many of them, uh, you know, uh, formed different organizations. One of them was a, a popular singing group, as you can see here. Uh, John Yerbus and his family, along with uh, several other ones, uh, including Charles Smilas, who, was, who served as the principal instructor. Uh, and, you know, there are other examples of Polish groups of other, of other types of organizations like this. Uh, and now all the small little towns throughout the region had some sort of local cultural presence uh, like this. Um, and, you know, even for people in the timber camps, you know, they could regularly come into the towns to, you know, obviously go to a saloon, go to the company store, uh, go to one of these uh, Italian or other immigrant run stores as well, and also to listen to music from the home country, listen to sort of uh, discussions about politics and you know, family life back in the home country as well. Uh, very sort of vibrant culture that, you know, existed in, 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 these, in these very sort of remote play parts of the state. Uh, you know, the, I say that, but the, you know, this area wasn't that remote, uh, you know, taking various train rides, it was fairly easy to, for immigrants to arrive in New York, uh, take the train sort of, you know, some would go down to Philadelphia first and then come across that way. Uh, but to kind of take your way from New York to go on, you know, through Western Maryland down, obviously here into this, uh, into this part of the state. And of course, you know, you have this uh, sort of existing uh, culture in many of these smaller towns, so places like a Douglas as well, uh, which was literally cut out of the wilderness and served as sort of a coal lumber you know, town, uh, small, but you know, majority uh, sort of various immigrant groups uh, living in the region. And many of them, and obviously these small towns, as I said, were, you know, connected by train, connected by uh, sort of uh, uh, other, other sort of, you know, not sort of modern modes of transportation for the time uh, that would allow people to obviously move uh, up and down sort of uh, throughout through the region. Just again, uh, some images of Coketon on the left, and this is by this is probably the only clear photo I've ever been able to really find that I like of Ben Bush. Just timing myself, trying to keep myself to this fifteen-minute initial conversation. Okay, we will. Tom, I think we'll go ahead and stop things there for a while to see if we have any questions or if we want to maybe discuss anything amongst ourselves, and then I can transition into talking about religion. All right. Um, let's, I want to, uh, we got two questions. I want to start my video. You need to stop sharing your screen or maybe not. You could continue to share your screen, and I think both of us would appear on there. Yeah. Uh, second i'm clicking on things to close them uh can you see me yeah good i can't see myself up to speaker view 
Uh, can you hear me now and see me? Yes. Well, that's interesting. I can't see myself. I don't even know how to do that. But I'll try a question. Any, yeah, there we go. And now uh, we got two descendant. One descendant made two comments so far in the Q and A. Lori Tobacco, director of go. the S and V Tobacco family, listening in this evening. That's delightful. And Venanzio was one of the great grandfathers of that person. Pretty yeah. cool. Uh, the uh, I wanted to uh, turn your attention to this. Uh, the question of what I found out the name rep repatriation that historians use. Mm -hmm. um, this, when they were talking about Italian immigrants uh, in the United States more generally during this period of time, a couple of history uh, compendious stories that I looked at said that uh, there were almost four. 0.2 million arrivals of immigrants from Italy during the period of about 1890 to 1920, and that 1.7 million returned to Italy. Many of quite many, mil, uh, you know, maybe a million permanently. Can you explain that a little bit? I mean, we've heard that people would go back, back, you know, get married, bring bring some of the family back, but I'm really interested in the phenomenon of people coming to the United States for apparently a couple of years working and then going back and, re and staying in Italy. How do you explain that? And how does that fit into the overall immigration at that time? Right. Well, most of them are often leaving uh, the home country for you know, a variety of reasons. Many of them uh, are driven by economic reasons. So uh, it, during this period of time, particularly in the 1890s, first decade of the 20th century, places like Italy, particularly southern Italy or central Italy, where most of these Italian immigrants are coming from, and more so, you know, parts of, you know, what's now Slovenia, you know, Poland, that part of Eastern Europe. These were areas that were going through rapid industrial change as well, and particularly for people from rural backgrounds, this was a pretty rough, uh, rough transition. So many of them uh, were migrating within Europe itself, you know, finding a variety of types of work, uh, you know, working in coal, working in sulfur mines, working in uh, textile, and other types of factory types of work. Um, and by the 1890s or so, the average weekly wage that someone could earn in the United States was so far above what they could make uh, in this part of the world, that it, it was it was it was drawing lots of people to come over here, and many of them were you know saving as much money as they could. Some of them would you know save enough money and then go back. Many of them would continue to live here for a number of years, and they would just be sending what are known as remittances uh, back back home. Many local banks uh, would often you know this became a, a form of banking. You know one of the elements that banks you know, started. Uh, sort of adding a service for was to uh, help facilitate that process. Um, so that, you know, that's part of it. Italian immigrants in particular, you know, this phenomenon that you mentioned anywhere, you know, the studies show anywhere from maybe 25% to 40%, you know, don't stay in the United States. Either they go eventually somewhere else or they go back to Italy. Uh, there's a variety of reasons for that. Some of it some of it is part of the, when they left Italy, the country was still underdeveloped. And by the time you get towards World War I in the 20s, the country's become a little more developed uh, economically and sort of uh, infrastructure wise. Um, but that return migration is lower for other groups. So for Polish immigrants, it is dramatically lower. Uh, m many of them who leave and come to the United States, they stay permanently. It's more of, maybe they don't stay in New York, they end up sometime eventually in Chicago, or they start in Pittsburgh, end up in Wheeling, for example. Um, Jewish immigrants have the lowest repatriation rate because the reason they're migrating is economic and political repression. Um, so it, it kind of depended on these various groups. For the Slovenian and Lithuanian immigrants, it, uh, repatriation rates would have been a bit lower as well because of not only economic, but also cultural, 
uh, also, you know, some of the, some political uh, issues as well within some of the large uh, European empires of the day. All right, I, I got one more point that I want to uh, bring up, and then maybe you can go on and talk a little bit about the role of the, the church and the unique challenges that the Catholic Church especially faced with all these uh, immigrants. But let me hold up for you. Uh, one of Friends of Blackwater has been uh, designing and putting up these historic signs uh, in Thomas and Davis and down along the Blackwater Canyon Rail Trail. And this is uh, one about, it's called An Immigrant Family Served in War and Kept Davis Fed. It's about the Davis Lunchroom, which belonged to James and Lucy Quattro. And this is one of those, one of those families that stayed, you know, and made a, a commercial living for themselves. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the family, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to share that with you. It's a, it's a great story, and uh, it's been a great project for Friends of Blackwater to put together these signs. I think they got almost 16 historic signs put up in Tucker County in the last two years, put together by this guy named David Vago. He's a real a serious historian, and uh, he's done a great job of collecting some wonderful uh, old family photos. But he also talks a lot about technology and the, the you know how how things changed in the mines and the railroad industry. It was not a static situation. Um, the, 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 there were constant improvements in all sorts of technology and people had to adapt to them. And the hand loading era of the mines actually lasted longer than anything else. The mechanical loading of coal was one of the last things to uh, really uh, take off. Uh, for really generations, people were filling those coal cars with shovels. I don't know, you wanna say anything about this? That's, I just thought I'd point it out to you. No, that's, that, that's very neat. I need to I need to get back uh, in the region so that I can see some of that signage. But yeah, yeah, that's that's also one of the reasons that they're constantly in need of labor, uh, because uh, particularly in the mines and in coke ovens, um, it's very labor intensive. And it's you're right, Tom. It's very slow to mechanize. It doesn't really start until the the mid twenties, and even then, it's it's relatively slow. Um, you know, begin doesn't really begin to pick up until the 30s, 30s or so. So they're constantly needing more workers, you know, and unfortunately, there, you know, there's all, all, obviously a lot of turnover. There's also a lot of accidents and a lot of, you know, men that die in the mines. Uh, there's also a lot of injuries in the timber. Uh, timber, uh, those rates of accidents is a little harder for us to get because, you know, because the companies report those differently than the mines companies do but if you look at the west virginia and uh, report and uh, the reports of the annual uh, the annual reports of the department of mines excuse me uh they in very specific you know blunt details would describe how these uh men were injured how many of them met their demise and you know it, it's it, it's surprising when you read them uh and have and i have students read them they they're often surprised well it's very a large number of slavic names, Italian names, Greek, um, you know, obviously very, very much more diverse than maybe the, the region and the state is uh, often viewed as being. So maybe you should, maybe you should say, since you're talking about working conditions, maybe before turning to the church, I'm not trying to get you distracted, but um, there were two big gates that I noticed uh, in the labor history of, uh, of the region that I'm sure immigrant workers and immigrant families were really affected by. One was 1894, there was a big coal mine related uh, strike national, I think. And then uh, another, one, another one 25 years later in 1922. But yeah. sure, I, can you talk about the arc of that? that um. Well, that was actually going to be the sort of third uh, okay. little statement I was going to take. Take it. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll turn my thing off and you talk. Okay. Um, well, uh, since, since since Tom has asked about the labor labor side of it, let me uh, go ahead and sort of uh, jump into that. Uh, you know, because that is a kind of a nice sort of thing to transition transition into, so just give me one second here while I'm, okay, 
Give me one second here. Sorry, everybody. I was that was, I was expecting to go into a different section first, but that's okay. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so, as as Tom mentioned, there were two principal uh, labor strikes that happened uh, in the county. Uh, there were others, but they were not as uh, large. Let's say the first happened in 1894, which is one of the larger one of the first large coal strikes launched by the United Mine Workers of America uh, nationally. Uh, the union had only been formed four years later, and it's largely in response to the um, depression of 1893, uh, which until the 1929 crash was known as the Great Depression. Uh, it's a massive economic catastrophe that left the country in sort of an economic downturn for about four to five years. Uh, business was sort of flat across the country, and the coal, tr coal and coke trade was particularly hard hit. Uh, Davis Coal and Coke already by the summer of 1893 had to start laying off workers, having to cut costs to really try to deal with the situation. Uh, and in early 1894, the general manager uh, of, the of, of the company, Land Street, common names associated with the company store, uh, sent uh, a notice to all workers uh, in uh, the sort of larger coal field. Um, this was partly to try to keep workers, you know, sort of to stay uh, with the company, but also to try to uh, tamp down some of these calls for unionization as well. Al, Al, yes, can you hear me? yes um, I can. Are you sharing a screen? Yes, I am. I'm getting some feedback from the audience that they're not getting it. Uh, I'm not sure why. Okay, well. Are you seeing it? Yeah. Yeah. Let me try to share again and see if I can get that to work for you. How about now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Is it all right if I just stay? Is it all right if I just stay in this? Because I think when we keep going to the full screen, that's causing me some problems of trying to follow where I'm at. Yes, it's all right. Okay. Yeah, I, I apologize, everyone, but this is it's a little easier for me to see what I'm looking at here. Um, well, as I was saying, and you can see here on the side of the screen, this is a handbill uh, that workers issued, uh, you know, by May. Uh, but earlier in February, the general manager, uh, Landstreet, had tried to entice the workers to uh, sort of stay with the company and not go out on strike. Uh, they were going to reduce the rent miners had to pay from $5 a month to $4 a month, which might sound good. It definitely would sound good now, but uh, during a time of economic depression, you know, still $4 a month. Um, coal furnished by the company. Uh, that miners used to heat their homes would be cut by 20%. Figure you probably should get that coal for free since you're mining it. Uh, there were there was a charge that miners were paid to sharpen their picks, uh, and that that was reduced but not done away with. Uh, and there was a 20% deduction in, in fees to pay for the company doctor. Um, as you can imagine, none of this really appeased many of the miners. Um, who were dealing with bearing the brunt of these economic conditions. Uh, so beginning in April of 1894, miners uh, began organizing in the Elk Garden in George's Creek region. And over the next several weeks, man, men began to present local grievances to uh, mine foremen um, and, and called walkouts in a variety of towns. Uh, this spread to uh, through Tucker County in, in the mines in Thomas and Copeton. And by late May, as you can see here in this handbill, noted, uh, miners were noting a much larger strike for this wider, what was then referred to as the Elk Garden uh, District. This incorporated Western Maryland, the sort of wider area around Thomas as well. Uh, and several thousand miners had appointed commissioners to meet with the company, demanding 50 cents per ton, an end to the company store, and to recognize the United Mine Workers Union. 
the company and in Henry Gassaway Davis's papers here in the West Virginia Regional History Center, we have a good sense of how the company responded to all of this. Uh, C.W. Daly, who was the general counsel for the company, noted to Thomas B. Davis, Henry's brother, uh, a day after this was issued, uh, that in Coke and miners walked off the job reporting, quote, personal violence was not resorted to and I do not believe would have been. The purpose is to shut entirely down, to cut off all expenses and wait until the men are enough to work to some advantage, uh, basically hoping they can sort of wait the miners out and that this will sort of go away. Um, Land Street eventually had about 200 men uh, in Coke and ready to work by May the 24th. And uh, Davis himself had sent to Richmond to get a large number of African-American men who were basically serving as strike breakers. Uh, these men were guarded by the deputy sheriffs uh, and other men uh, supportive of the company who were armed with Winchester rifles. Um, the men were quickly brought in under protection and put to work in the various mines throughout the region. Uh, if the strike didn't end quickly, Land Street told Davis that they would actually need to bring more African-American miners. Uh, they would need more from Virginia, probably from Baltimore as well. Um, I won't quote directly what they've said, which I have in my notes because they used the language of the time period, which is not appropriate to describe uh, these strike breakers. Um, but within a few days, mine managers are noting that uh, more miners are going off the job uh, and, this is, and it's beginning to expand. Although by June the 5th, uh, company officials noted that 38 loads of coal had been shipped out of Douglas and Coked, and so they're starting to break down uh, this strike. The strike remains strongest in Thomas itself. Uh, that's where they sort of, uh, sort of maintain a pretty, pretty strong presence. Um, there were all kinds of rumors spreading throughout Western Maryland, as far away as Cumberland, that miners were going to spread throughout the region, uh, you know, and sort of start a riot, basically. Um, Maryland militia troops were uh, made at the ready starting on June the 5th, um, and sort of the area was put on uh, high alert. Uh, on the 5th, you know, things were going pretty well uh, at Copeton. Uh, and things seem to be uh, going, going fairly well. This is an image uh, around late May showing the UMWA miners on strike, uh, posing for a picture here at Coketon. Uh, you know, this is a large immigrant group. Uh, you can see several African-American miners as well. They have several flags here in the back. This one on the right is clearly an American flag. I'm not entirely sure what the left, one on the left is. It's not, it's not entirely clear. Uh, and here, of course, on the same day are you know, uh, guards uh, armed uh, at Coketon to sort of protect uh, strike breakers who are being brought in to work uh, the company's operations. Things turned on June the 13th, 1894, when there was a reported riot in Thomas. And I say riot in air quotes. Uh, Land Street, writing from the county seat Parsons uh, on the following day, noted, quote, an attempted riot at Thomas is now being investigated, end quote, by county officials. Uh, according to the correspondence we have from the company, uh, this strike was being led by a Polish immigrant, uh, several other uh, Polish immigrants and their wives. Uh, according to the county sheriff, these immigrants, had, the main ringleader, had been run out of the county, uh, even though they were still, uh, still looking for them. Uh, the, the company used the court system fairly effectively, uh, and indictments were issued against a variety, particularly 30 leading strikers who had had a main role to play in organizing, uh, organizing the strike. Polish coal miners in the Thomas region continued to protest. Uh, and even as late as June 20th, a week later, many of them were still refusing uh, to go to work. Uh, one thing that did help in the situation here, as opposed to in Southern West Virginia, where often you would see bloodshed in these types of strikes, uh, was that Henry Gassaway Davis himself uh, often intervened to try to tamp down the sort of animosity 
in particular, he did he he did not urge his managers to evict miners from their homes. So that more quintessential image we have of armed guards, particularly the Baldwin Phelps Detective Agency in Southern West Virginia, coming in to evict miners during the strike. That didn't happen. Uh, Davis actually told uh, Landstreet uh, in his own words why why he didn't want to do this, and I think it's an illustrative quote. He says. Quote, it appears to me that if I was a tenant, my goods should be taken out and left in the street, that I would be more desperate than I otherwise would be, more likely to commit unlawful acts. In the uh, you know, and so that's, that is a little bit of a unique thing in the way these strikes often went. Obvi often the, the owner is often intensifying the escalation of tensions. In this case, Davis is actually trying to play a more moderating role. The strike eventually subsides by early July. Uh, the company eventually only allowed about one third of the men who went out on strike to return to work for primarily at its operations in Coketon and Thomas where the strike had been the, the strongest. Uh, and so this is where a large number of the African-Americans they would come in, many of them will stay on and continue to work for the company for a while. Uh, but even after this strike, a number of years later, the company is still complaining about the fact that it doesn't have enough workers. Uh, Superintendent John W. Galbraith noted in May of 1901, quote, natives, meaning native born Americans, are very scarce indeed. What few we have had, have had only stayed a few days and have gone into the woods, end quote, meaning uh, to work in the timber operations, which paid anywhere, paid a bit higher than what the mines were paying at that time. And so he noted to the company that he, that they were having to go, they were having to rely increasingly more on foreign workers, particularly Italians, uh, among, among many others. And this, this continued to become a regular sort of occurrence for the company, uh, in that first decade or so of the, uh, of the 20th century. So, can you hear me out? Yes. So um, there's a long gap between 1894 and the next big uh, one that we have photographs and historical coverage of the 1922 one. Uh, what accounts for that? Well, some of that we we actually have some oral history interviews that were done with immigrant miners back in the 1960s. A couple of uh, oral his, uh, historians, John Steely was one of them, actually did a, a number of oral interviews. And they, 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 they found a few interesting things from talking to some of these immigrant miners. Many of them noted a couple of things. One was that the company was what, what we would call today more paternalistic. Eventually, they paid higher wages than other coal companies would pay. Their houses were better. They had more amenities. It was cleaner. So there wasn't that sort of, I guess, to compare it again to Southern West Virginia, there wasn't that desperation conditions that existed. Uh, so some of them noted that many, many men were like, well, what, what difference does it matter to have the union when, you know, this is, this company's paying us pretty well. Uh, you know, others noted as well the transitory nature of the workforce, you know, as we mentioned, if there's a lot of immigrants coming in, coming out, migrating to the next job, it makes it hard to really try to organize a union. Um, many of them noted that, that the company as well, you know, discouraged unionism as much as possible, uh, either through, you know, subtle coercion or, you know, just speaking, you know, how, how useless the union might be, um, but they didn't have they didn't have the sort of repressive system that you know we would think of in, in the southern portion of the state. And the and in the nineteen twenties, uh, things must have changed somehow. Uh, was that an, a national economic uh, issue where the coal companies really uh, just were 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 harder to deal with because it was difficult for them too yeah and the and, and the and the union did finally gain some strength in tucker county during world war one and that was common in many parts of the state uh during world war one the the federal government set up a number of regulatory bodies uh to really kind of you know keep 
the coal being mined for the war effort in exchange that kind of encouraged uh, operators to recognize the union. Uh, so in the Fairmont coal field, uh, um, you know, Consolidated Coal recognizes the union in during World War I. Uh, here, the union is able to gain a foothold uh, in 1917, 1918 as well. But once the war is over, uh, when the war is over, they have a situation very similar to what we're all dealing with now. Uh, there's rising inflation. Um, Miners' wages start to not keep up with the rising costs of goods. Uh, and, and, and coal companies, their profit margins on uh, selling coal had been quite high during the war, and now they start to decrease a bit. So the companies want to cut back. Uh, obviously, one way of doing that would be to break up union contracts that maybe have set higher wages uh, and other, you know, sort of uh, other set costs like increased safety or having to hire a, another sort of couple check weighman or something else. Um, so, you know, companies begin pushing back against that in the or in in the sort of a year or so after World War One. Some of that is what is leading to sort of the what's known as the mine wars in the southern part of the state. Uh, in 1922 is a national strike like 1894. So it's a strike that's being supported nationally by uh, the newer UMWA president, John L. Lewis, um, you know, it's very, it's very active in the Midwest, in Pennsylvania and Ohio, uh, but in West Virginia, it, it largely fails. Um, and, and this is happening a year or so, uh, you know, not really a year, but, you know, a number of months after the failed uh, march on Blair Mountain that uh, happened in Logan County and late August, to early September of 1921. Do you, in your slides there, do you have uh, um, that some of the pictures that were taken of the um, the 1922 strike? Is that yeah, I can I can go ahead and sort of uh, sort of move into that as well. Uh, like I said, it's a little it's a little tricky for me to. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay. I think that that really tells them, you know. So, do, do you think that uh, that the fact that so many of these folks, uh, miners, were born in other countries and came, were, had come here and were new to the U.S., how did that really affect the the ability of uh, organized labor to to speak for and mobilize those people? Maybe in some good ways, maybe in bad ways. I think in some good ways, many of them actually were more receptive to unions than uh, native born workers were, honestly. Yep. Many of them came from countries that had a strong labor tradition. Um, you know, some of them had problems with the language barrier, obviously. One benefit with the United Mine Workers Union was that at the time in the early 20th century, they were really on the cutting edge of this sort of industrial form of union organizing. So organizing all workers across uh, the entire industry, regardless of race, regardless of ethnicity, uh, that was very uncommon in many unions uh, in other sectors. Uh, and so they, would, they actively had organizers who were from those immigrant backgrounds. So when they're organizing a campaign, they would have an Italian language organizer. They would bring in somebody who could speak Polish. Uh, they would bring in people that, you know, could sort of communicate effectively to uh, this sort of uh, multi-ethnic uh, multi workforce. Uh, I, I want to, uh, Hal, we can, we've got a little bit of time. I want to encourage the folks in the audience to, uh, uh, type in a question or a comment in the Q&A so we can uh, get to it because we're closing in on it or certainly the last half hour of the program. So exciting. We've got 20 people who've been attending the, the entire event and uh, you know, learning a great deal. Uh, can we, we're talking about languages. I just want, I, there's a, a chance to segue here to away from the labor stuff, but so we can cover it and talk about the, uh, the, the other big, a big, huge institution in so many people's lives, the church uh, who attended. Uh, uh, I mean, I realized that uh, if the, these people are just coming for a couple of years, but they came from cultures that had extensive religious traditions and uh, mostly Catholic, I imagine, although the German immigrants that were, who were a little bit earlier, you had a strong Lutheran tradition and, you know, there were 
uh, dunkers and different, all kinds of different uh, religious ethnicities that have come to Tucker County. But if we look at this one period that we've been talking about, a lot of uh, Roman Catholics, I don't know about Greek Orthodox and Orthodox Catholics, but a lot of diversity now, and yet all kind of packed together in one uh, very close geographic area, uh, not so that they kind of had to get along and the Catholic Church probably had to serve a lot of different languages. Well, you want to talk about that a little bit, the religious part of this? Yeah, I, I can do that. Uh, let me uh, one second here and I will share again just so we can look at it a little bit here. I think if I do this, can you see the screen well, Tom? Yes, we can. Okay. So th this is this is this is this is honestly the way I got into this topic uh, years ago was just through some of the work I had done in the Catholic uh, diocese archives in Wheeling. Uh, I was researching mainly for the book that uh, you know, Tom mentioned earlier. And I just kept finding all of these files about issues in Tucker County, uh, which at that time I didn't know they had this sort of diverse immigrant population. But as you mentioned, everywhere in the state where we saw large numbers of Italian, other Catholic immigrants come in, one of the first things they want to do when that population gets large enough and established, for people who want to maintain a, a longer presence uh, for that population, one of the first things they'll do is they'll create a religious society, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with the goal that that can get enough numbers, get enough people to generate enough support to petition the Catholic bishop, uh, who at this time is uh, Patrick Donahue uh, in Wheeling, to encourage him to uh, finance, help finance the construction of a parish. Uh, the control of having some physical space uh, to sort of call their own, so to speak, uh, is a very common thing you see in these immigrant communities. Now, part of the issue here is a little different than what we see in the urban areas of the state. Uh, any of the land where any of these churches are going to be built on are owned by Davis Colin Coke or Henry Gasway Davis or someone like that. So there's a lot of back and forth often between company officials and the diocese about, yes, we will give you the deed to this land, you know, they'll want some input on, you know, well, what type of parish is it going to be? And the diocese historically would always want to build parishes that what we would call territorial. Territorial meaning, as you can see here, building a Catholic parish in Davis that all Catholics would attend. So all the Catholics in Davis and the surrounding area, this would be your parish. That may not seem you know, hard for us to understand now, but this is a multi-ethnic workforce. And so naturally, you know, you would have Italians, Slovenians, Poles, Lithuanians, Croatians, all attending a parish. Well, uh, at this time, most of the mass is done in Latin, obviously, um, before the changes in the mid 20th century. Uh, but, you know, the, the music, the homily, all of those aspects uh, are kind of set by whoever the priest is. So if you have early on an Irish Catholic priest, which most of the hierarchy at this time in the country are Irish or German, you know, they're going to speak in English or in German. So you start seeing this push pretty early on uh, to get uh, a sort of revolving door of sort of foreign language speaking priests from a variety of different backgrounds. Uh, and it kind of reflects some of the wider changes that are happening in these parishes, so particularly St. Thomas and St. Veronica's. Uh, initially, the, the parish in Thomas initially was made up of Irish and French uh, Canadian Catholics who mostly spoke English, of course. Uh, as time went on, the parish sort of changed it became much more an Italian and Polish parish with numbers of Slovenians, Croatians, even Russians and Lithuanians. Um, in Davis as well, you saw a similar thing where it started out very clearly as like an Irish uh, sort of parish, but then as time went on, you know, kind of brought in other, uh, other groups. 
Uh, in Thomas, for example, just to give you a sense of this change, the first families that helped found that parish, uh, their last names were Noon, Gallagher, Curran, Higgins, and O'Day. Very Irish Catholic sounding names. Um, and by the late 1890s, turn of the 20th century, there are so many more Eastern and Southern European immigrants demanding to have services in their native language uh, that this is going to create some changes. So just to give you a sense there on the screen, uh, in the parish there in Thomas, you have ministers who change pretty, have very short tenures, but you can tell are reflecting more of this sort of uh, multi-ethnic uh, sort of background. So in particular, uh, they're trying to get parish priests who, you know, speak multiple languages or who are, you know, either Polish, Slovenian, Croatian, so that they represent a lar uh, one of those larger groups. Um, the, the Catholic Church in Thomas at its height actually had about 2,000 people and they had to have several services on Sunday. Uh, and as I said, they, they had kind of a revolving door of different parish priests. Uh, from my own research in Wheeling and elsewhere, this could be for a number of reasons. Sometimes those priests would get tired of having to deal with all of this friction between trying to uh, serve this multi-ethnic population. Priests also would sort of serve there in the parish, but then they would also have to go out to the timber camps. They would have to go out uh, if they set up any missions uh, in the outlying areas of the county. So they often would complain that they were sort of on this sort of perpetual mission trip uh, to really kind of serve the sacraments to everybody uh, equally throughout, throughout the county. Uh, as the numbers in the timber industry and coal industry start to change in the 20s and 30s, uh, you start to see, you know, uh, see these populations obviously start to uh, start start to decrease a bit. How? Uh, go ahead. No, no, no go ahead. Uh, that's I'm just looking at your your slide there. Uh, what? Go back. Could you go back to that uh, that slide there? Because I barely saw that one. The the one with the yeah right. Who's that? A picture of. That is uh, Bishop Patrick Donahue, the, the Catholic Bishop, Bishop of Wheeling. I see. And so the problem that the company has uh, and that the diocese have, as you can see, they, technically the company employs at least 22 different nationalities, most of which are Roman Catholic. Uh, and so beginning in 1904 or so, the bishop is constantly trying to find parish priests either in Pittsburgh or in other larger cities to see if they would be willing to relocate to Tucker County. Um, and initially, one of the disputes involves trying to get a, a Lithuanian priest, uh, whose name you can see, they, uh, see there on the screen, Joseph uh, Satokas from Pittsburgh. This upset the priest in Thomas, who was Polish, who didn't necessarily want to work with a Lithuanian priest. Um, <clears throat> uh, but this Lithuanian uh, priest actually looked forward to the idea of working in Thomas uh, because as the Polish priest argued, quote, he considers that in our place, the missionary work with the languages he possesses would be a great benefit to the church and community of Thomas. So the fact that he could speak multiple languages could sort of cater to different people, um, and the company was very concerned about appealing to this large and growing Lithuanian population around Thomas. So uh, one of the company managers, a man named J.F. Healy, uh, in one letter asked Donahue for, quote, priests who can speak Lithuanian. Uh, and that had been a big need in the parish for a number of years. And Lithuanian miners and their families uh, had basically been demanding that any of the priests there uh, needed to be able to speak in Lithuanian. Uh, this was a concern for the bishop and for the uh, other leaders in Wheeling because they, they, they would prefer to not, they would prefer them just to listen to a, and have a central figure to follow. Uh, the danger for uh, Donahue is the fact that what this often did in parts of the state would, would lead to parishes splitting off. Uh, so if a population got large enough, let's say in this case, if the Lithuanian population got large enough, they may actually have enough numbers to demand another parish. So this could become costly uh, for the diocese. Uh, 
the chancellor of the diocese, Edward Weber, noted quite bluntly this problem, saying, quote, one district wants a Croatian or Croat, another a Greek, another a Hungarian, another a Pole, another a German, another a Lithuanian, etc. Hardly a week passes, but what there is a request for a priest of some foreign nationality, end quote. <laughs> The company itself often had disputes between English speaking miners and particularly the Polish Lithuanian miners. And the company's perspective was they hoped that if the parish could become strong enough, the parish would maybe serve as an Americanizing force to kind of calm down the situation uh, a bit. Uh, and J.F. Healy, as you can see in this quote in 1906 notes, the Americans could have one mass each Sunday and the Poles, Lithuanians and Slovenians the other you know, as a way to try to, you know, maybe accommodate uh, this situation. Um, I got a question for you, uh, came in. The question is, uh, what ethnicities, and around uh, the time that you're talking about, which were the, what was the largest and the dominant? What, uh, the Italians would have been the largest by number. Um, I, I, I hate to say this, but in the Italian immigrant community, there's a lot of literature about, you know, communities, uh, people, uh, large numbers within the Italian immigrant population that are very religious, very tied to the parish. And then there's this very strong anti-clerical tradition as well. Um, I would say in terms of Catholic, this sort of Catholic sentiment, it's strongest amongst the Polish and Lithuanian uh, miners and their families. And I would say also the Slovenian, smaller Croatian. Uh, population as well. Another question that we have uh, is uh, politics. Uh, obviously, an interesting time in West Virginia politics. And I don't know if you've looked into the, uh, the, the uh, by now, the Republicans are ascendant statewide. Uh, Henry Gassaway Davis was a uh, Democrat, Democrat, the grand old man of the Democratic Party. But his son-in-law, Stephen Elkins, was a Republican, and they both were out looking out for the coal companies and the rich people in sure. general. But uh, still, there was partisan politics, and I think Tucker County uh, switched from a uh, Democrat majority in the presidential elections in the 1890s to uh, electing Republicans, and they were in power for quite a while after that time. Um, they, the Democrats had taken power in the 1870s and uh and it was in the mid 1890s and switched back to republicans well the question that the participant asked is uh how did the church uh, come down uh, on uh, political issues what influence do they have if you know yeah um it's an interesting thing because they try to stay out of it i would say in terms of like what parish priests concerns are, let's say, between the Democrats and the Republicans. Now, one thing they are very unified against is any Socialist Party influence. Um, there's a big concern at this time in the Catholic uh, hierarchy about socialism and you know, the growth of the Socialist Party in the state. Donahue himself actively courts uh, support from both parties. <laughs> uh, he's, you know, he's a pretty effective bishop in that regard. Um, one, but as time goes on, by the turn of the 20th century, you're seeing more of these immigrants, particularly the Southern Eastern Europeans, they, they'll gravitate slowly but surely more to the Democratic Party uh, for a number of reasons, um, one of which being you know, the role of prohibition, but that takes, that takes until the teens and 20s to really happen. But uh, many of the immigrants and even some of the ones in the oral history interviews that I mentioned that we have here when asked about voting, because they'd say, the interviewer would say, well, the county was very Republican. Uh, what did you vote? And they were like, I was a Democrat, but I could never vote that way, basically. You know, you, you, had, to, you had to vote Republican because the people looking at your ballots worked for the company and they wanted you to vote Republican. So uh, most, most of them, you know, some of them say that there was a more stronger coercion that went on. Some say it was just kind of a subtle, Sort of coercion, but you know that's mainly why 
uh, that, that's mainly why the, you know there was that sort of strong sort of uh, control. I got, I, I, you know, and I'm asking you. I'm talking here, and you can't see me. I guess so. I, I appreciate your your attentiveness, and I'm just interrupting. I don't care, but uh, the audience doesn't need to see me. Uh, I got I got a couple more comments here related to that. Is the question of what was the relationship between the church and the coal companies themselves? Did they? Were they concerned? Uh, were the co were the companies uh, fearful of the influence of the church? No, I actually, and that's a great question. Um, they actually really saw the church as something that could help them, and it was kind of this subtle thing that you know they don't want to show their hand so much among the miners, but you know, they, in, in their correspondence, and there is a lot of it in the diocese archives between company and fit. This is probably the company that I found the most of that sort of actual conversation that's documented. There's all kinds of letters talking about their hopes that the priests will Americanize the workforce, that they will, they never go out and say, like, to discourage the union or anything like that one of the biggest things that they wanted the, the churches to do was to stop the carousing all of the one of the big complaints company officials have was with the foreign holidays as i have listed here that workers these immigrant workers would take off for all of the saints days all of the variety of holidays uh and drink for three or four days <laughs> and you know that caused problems of you know we can't mine coal regularly because half the workforce took took two days off to celebrate a saint's day uh so could you maybe try to deal with that encourage them that it's important to work first and then you know corral later um so they kind of they kind of saw i think the church they saw the church as playing a sort of americanizing a sort of cultural influence let's say that's interesting uh, i've got a couple comments here uh, one person uh says just FYI, Archbishop John Hughes of New York, Gang of New York, which is a movie, a TV series, right? Uh, he was a cousin. Uh, his family emigrated from Ireland to Chambersburg, and the commoner's grandfather went to the Catholic high school in Cumberland. His, uh, and uh, so that's, that's pretty cool. We have a question, and one person said it's interesting to think Think of how things were handled differently in Wheeling with more ethnic parishes. Yeah. And, and that's quite, it, you know, it's not something that's self evident. Uh, it's interesting to me. I just want to make a couple of interesting points about the immigrant communities of Tucker County. I don't know if you've got a real response to them, but uh, I'll make it and turn this thing back over to you again. But um, two other ethnic groups, we haven't talked about the Germans much. And uh, yet they were amongst the earliest and very quite prosperous uh, uh, immigrants to Tucker County. Uh, and speaking of churches, the Lutheran Church in Davis is a it's just simply built in around 1890s, right, right around that's this period, a, a gorgeous uh, structure. And obviously people put some serious money into that and they were intending to congregate like crazy. That was a that's a beautiful thing and the first sawmill was uh, by henry you, you know something about this because you know about uh your because of your great podcast about henry schwamberger the great german brewer and these were very the germans had a very rich culture too but uh they had to sort of back off after world when world war one came along it, it caused them to sort of draw in their uh claws a little bit or something culturally any thought about German culture in Tucker County or German yeah. immigrants? Yeah. I think you're right that before this massive influx of Southern Eastern mm -hmm. European immigrants, they play a, a large role uh, in sort of, you know, a variety of areas of the county. You know, in if you just look at some of the people, as you mentioned, that own bit, small businesses that are that some of the lumber companies as well, many of them are Germans. Uh, Germans who arrived in the mid 19th century or in the years right after the Civil War. Uh, many of them were more, let's say, they, they had entrepreneurial backgrounds in a variety of ways. Uh, I, I think what's interesting here is that 
that group got so overwhelmed by this mass influx of Polish, Italian, Slovenian, uh, you know, they kind of get sort of lost uh, in the story a bit. Uh, but, you know, in, in, in many areas of the state during that time, as you noted, during World War I, uh, any outright German influence is sort of shunned. Uh, you know, uh, if you look at the population numbers from Tucker County, they, they certainly reflect this population incursion. You're talking uh, at its peak 16,000 people starting with, you know, a, a, a thousand in 1870 or something like that, or 2000, working its way up to about 7,000 for quite a while. And then all of a sudden, kaboom, it explodes and gets up to 16,000. And now we're back down to about 7,000 folks. Like a, a, quite an arc and- uh, 14%, what about that? He's all we are told. Is, my, yeah, Judy's 14%. here talking to me too. She's gonna tell me what's going on. Hey, uh, we we're down, uh, Hal, we, we got uh, 15 minutes at the most to go. So what do you what do you want to touch on? Oh, the other ethnic group I want to talk about is let's not forget the French Canadians who came to Canaan Valley to cut timber for the Rumbargers because nobody local knew how to float those logs. Uh, I, in my imagination, at least a couple of them met local girls and stuck around. <laughs> well, and, and as I mentioned, they, they had a pretty prominent presence uh, initially in several of those two early Catholic parishes I mentioned. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I mean, they, those parishes were, I would say, you know, if they, as much Irish as much as French Canadian uh, to a certain extent. But, but again, once this big mass of immigrants arrive in the 1890s, turn of the 20th century, you know, they, they kind of get I don't want to say lost in the shuffle, but well, but some of those earlier groups might have a little bit better staying power, you know, legacy in the county because you know they've been here for a longer period of time, you know, intermarry with the native-born population or you know with other established older immigrant populations. So, whereas those other older groups that come later in larger numbers, yeah, they come in larger numbers, but then there's a large number of them that leave uh, as well over time. So carry on, Hal. What, how would you like to wrap this up as you talk about this fabulous melting pot? Um, here. I'm trying to think what we haven't talked about yet. Um, um, do we have any more questions? Uh, in let, me, let, me just, let me take a look down here. Uh, we got some people mentioning that uh, they had ancestors from the Germana colony. Well, yeah, so uh, one question was, uh, uh, and you, I don't think you directly addressed this, what about racial tension? I mean, obviously, uh, Blacks coming in to uh, be uh, strike breakers is not going to make anybody very happy. But in fact, we, when we look at pictures and we hear stories, we see that uh, both Tucker, uh, there were uh, segregated schools that were established uh, and uh, black coal miners uh, raised families and uh, prospered in many ways and uh, worked side by side with whites for the same money and uh, at, you know, the same kinds of tough labor. And so I think there was probably a lot of camaraderie and respect as well. What, what, is, what are you as a historian, what's your sense about it? Yeah, I mean, this is the height of the emergence of Jim Crow racism. Um, and, and obviously that role that many of those African-American miners played in 1894 as strike breakers, you know, that, that does create a lot of tension, uh, obviously. Um, you know, the Klan had a presence, you know, in the area as well. Uh, but the Klan, to be honest, by the time of the teens and the 20s, when the Klan comes back, nationally, the Klan is just as much anti-immigrant as it is anti-African-American. So, um, you know, like you said, a lot of these miners, a lot of these sort of working class folks that, you know, work in the similar industry have, you know, very similar conditions, you know, they have, they have some camaraderie that, you know, is important to note. But I think it's also important to note their housing was segregated. Like they were physically segregated in where they lived. So in many of these company towns, I didn't mention this, that they would sort of self-segregate the, the neighborhoods almost. Like 
this would be the group where the Italian miners would be living. This is where the Hungarian miners lived. Uh, African American miners notoriously either lived the furthest away from the mine portal, so that they had to walk the furthest to get to work, or they would live, they would often be uh, housed right next to a mine portal. So the dirtiest, the most dangerous place. Um, so, and, and as you mentioned, you know, obviously in the research you've all done uh, previously, there, there's a lot of, you know, they have segregated schools. There's a lot of, you know, aspects of segregation that exist, uh, exist as well. And where those tensions come back later is when the mines begin to mechanize later on and you have work, you know, there's going to be a need for fewer workers. Uh, African-American miners are often the first fired and the last rehired is the common the common phrase. Uh, or if they are kept on, they're not allowed to learn uh, how to use maybe the, the technology so they can move up. Uh, but in this hand loading era where everybody's kind of loosely, you know, kind of making similar wages, kind of dealing with similar conditions, you know, there is a certain level of, you know, camaraderie maybe going on. Question, did coal companies provide health care services? How was that handled? They did. Uh, they, they had company doctors. Uh, they had a pretty elaborate system uh, where, you know, they would, a doctor, you could go see doctors. You could, uh, they would have doctors that would, you know, go around as well. Uh, that was one of the things the company often liked to, to praise about itself, you know, compared to other companies. Uh, they sponsored regular first aid competitions and other safety uh, things as well to try to, you know, keep their, you know, accident rates down uh, as well. Uh, and I, I know I talked about this last time when, when the Spanish flu pandemic, as it was called back then, the company actually set up a number of, you know, company uh, hospitals, you know, throughout the region, you know, in the various uh, camps throughout the county to you know, try to deal with the, the rising numbers of people in 1918, 1919 that came down with the, uh, the flu. Um, so, you know, they were, I, I don't want to say pretty progressive for that time period, but let's say compared to uh, some of these other coal companies in the state that, you know, didn't necessarily provide that type of a service. Again, that was one of the things that made it hard for the union to really gain traction for a while was the company provided so much. Uh, there in Tucker County that it, you know, didn't seem, why do we need to go on strike? What, what do we need? Necessarily. I think I've uh, gone through pretty much all the questions that we had. Uh, oh, somebody wanted to know about uh, environmental issues uh, related to the coal mining. Uh, did immigrants uh, have sensitivity about that? I'll tell you what, before you answer that, let me just uh, go ahead and mention something. One of the, uh, as I was researching for this uh, event, I saw that um, uh, one, some, one of the big sources of uh, labor from the folks who came from Italy was Sicily. And that uh, Sicily had a remarkable and rather uh, frightening uh, industry of mining sulfur. Some of the world's great sulfur deposits are in Sicily and they were mined deep in the earth. It was like 125 degrees down there. They had children doing the mining. It was just ghastly. And uh, that, that industry collapsed at the end of the 1800s, I think because sulfur was discovered as a byproduct of oil refining. And whatever it was, uh, a lot of sulfur miners left Sicily and came to the United States and worked in deep mines. I'm sure many uh, ended up in uh, West Virginia. Uh, but uh, we'll talk about an environmental catastrophe. That was just extraordinary. But do you have any thoughts about the miners uh, and sensitivity to environmental issues? I mean, in, in coal at this time, you know, there is some concern, but this is before the sort of period of like, you know, dealing with large amounts of black lung, let's say, which is more of a health condition. I mean, obviously working in the lumber, uh, the lumber process, yeah, the deforestation really the that's happening, you know, it is, I mean, one thing I would say that they would be more aware of at this time 
uh, that we maybe don't appreciate. The state had a large number of sort of major environmental problems that were starting to crop up in the, let's say the first decade and a half of the 20th century. So they would have been dealing with regular flooding. They would have been digging, de dealing with almost, you know, periods of heavy rains followed by, you know, period of heavy drought conditions. Uh, because of the, you know, clear cutting of the forest throughout the region, you know, it's very hot in the summer. Uh, whenever it rains, they're dealing with mudslides and other, you know, other issues to, you know, if they were trying to form this combination. If you, if you look at the, uh, some of the uh, standard histories of Tucker County written by local folks, uh, they really do, it's remarkable, uh, point to community leaders uh, who expressed uh, real regret at the destruction, the total destruction of the forest. Uh, I mean, it was accepted as something that was it, not much that folks could do about it but uh, it was seen as, as a great loss. And I think that's some of the older folks who'd been far, came from agricultural backgrounds and things like that, just hated to see that sort of thing. And they expressed that even at the time, but the dynamic of uh, defeating those sawmills until there wasn't a single big tree left, uh, yeah. really could not be arrested, could it? Yeah, I would add also the one other area where workers would often talk about, you know, uh, changes to the environment. P people who worked in, near Coke ovens and worked, you know, and lived near Coke ovens, the Coke, that Coke process, it, it produced a lot of air pollution, it put a lot of, you know, various chemicals up into the air. So people would often comment, you know, the smell, of, you know, what it would smell like, what it, you know, what it, you know, burn your eyes, you know, burn your throat. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's another area where you often hear people uh, comment at the time about, you know, some of those, what we would consider uh, environmental conditions as well. Al, I'm trying to turn on my camera. I don't know if it'll, I don't know if it'll work or not. Yeah. Uh, put the gallery view up. I, I just want to hold up another copy of your book. Oh, thank you. we got to plug the book. <laughs> I appreciate um, it. This has been a great uh, great program. I, I really enjoyed it. I'm sure everybody else did. Let me see if I got any more comments uh, down here. This was a terrific session. That's what that's what we like to hear. Yeah, I told I've told Tom that I have been on a couple of these where we've kind of mixed it up. Instead of having somebody just talk, we do some lecture material, then do some questions, and do some back and forth, and it's. It's a bit more engaging. I, I know I like it as well, um, and and also you know allows for some democratic participation to maybe uh, take me off script a little bit, which is yeah, yeah. fun. We got um, just want to let people know so that uh, we've got a very exciting uh, program coming up in uh, July, July sixteenth. It's a Saturday uh, at the uh, old courthouse in uh, Parsons. Uh, program called Shootout at the Depot about a famous uh, feud uh, and a book of, uh, between uh, the Eastham Thompson case, a fabulous murder trial. We're going to reenact the thing with the local folks participating. We're co-sponsoring that with uh, Art Spring, I think, and also with the Tucker County Historical Society. Tucker County's history is a rich and valuable asset, and it's just, we like to shine shine the light of uh, appreciation and understanding on it. And that's what the point of this program was. I think we did it. Thank you, Al. Thank you, everybody, for, uh, I'm looking at the camera. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Al, final words? I, I just thank you all for turning out on a late uh, evening on, on a Wednesday. So I appreciate it. This has been fun. Take care, everybody. We, we'll have a recording, or at least a part of a recording, I didn't start until a little late up on the um, up on the Friends of Blackwater website real soon. Thank you. Bye.